Hello, everyone. I'm Michael. 12 seconds. 12 seconds it was the average human attention span back in the year 2000. We are now in 2019, and this attention span has actually dropped just eight seconds, which, in fact, is less than the attention span of a goldfish. <laughs> I see some of you are already on their phone. <laughs> My background is in very straightforward architecture. I really enjoy drawing floor plans and designing physical spaces. But I also have a great interest in stage design and stage technology especially. It's about designing atmospheres with other things than just brick walls and wood. It's using sound, lighting, video and projection. My master in design for performance and interaction at the Bartlett School of Architecture gave me the opportunity to combine the two world, worlds together. And I looked into ways on how we can bridge the gap between a stage and an audience. When we look at sort of classic stage layouts, whether this is an ancient Greek theater or a very modern Tomorrowland festival stage, one can see that the spatial layout hasn't changed that much, but of course the use of technology has increased a lot, and especially, especially when looking at music and concert stages. Effect, loads of effects are being added, like laser, video lighting and pyrotechnics, to constantly keep, uh, give new inputs to the audience and maintain their attention. Immersive is another new trend coming up everything's starting to turn immersive in terms of uh, experience design. Sound, lighting, video is starting to go 360 and surround the audience. It's also very often used as advertisement, as for example, last year's Creamfields Festival used their new stage as an immersive experience advertisement. And as you can see, all the infrastructure, sound, lighting, and video is surrounding the audience and forming a space. But when you look closely, the actual stage and the performance is still in that one single spot. Another example is the yet-to-be-built Madison Square Garden sphere, one to be built in London and one in Las Vegas, and as well advertised as fully immersive with um, 360 focused sound and big, big dome projections. But again, a closer look shows that the actual performance area is still right in front of the audience, in one fixed spot. Now, as we have a stage design that is currently sort of shaping more and more around the audience, I was wondering, can we not use, make use of all this technology available and even take this further and also fragment the stage and the performance and distribute it across the audience? This would lead to those unexpected little moments. Hang on, Michael. Let me explain this part. It is like those little unexpected moments during a theater play where an actor appears in the back of the audience area and walks through the audience towards the stage. It is those unexpected inputs that rearrange the spatial layout of the performance experience it very much starts to include the audience into the performance and, well, creates an almost immersive experience. And as we just had one of those unexpected little inputs now, and everyone is awake again, back over to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> so to test all those ideas, I looked at one specific type of technology, the use of holographic projections. And I started to place them in random places, random unexpected little sp stages across the city, like the red telephone box in London. Or just like placing myself in a jar. I know I'm not that tall, but I still need a bit of magic trickery to actually fit into a glass bottle. Another project was the Holland Cube project. It's an experiment that is less about fragmenting the stage, but more about rearranging the story. Oh, the quick, the rise, well, alligator, brown fox, the and lady yes, is an alligator. Inside. No, it was a croc. It was a crocodile, no, not a alligator. Are you sure? <laughs> Each of the four mirrored sides of the Holland Cube represent the story, and when 
a person in the audience interacts with one of the sides, that side will tell a story. But when there is more people, when there are more people interacting with the Holland Cube, the different stories will start to mix up and the, world, the words will form new meaning. So it will be a unique um, performance each time the audience interacts with it. However, if we take a performance or a story and fragment it and rearrange it, it will add complexity. So I thought, I was looking for stories and performances that are very simple to understand. And a marble run, which in fact is a very strong childhood memory of myself, this is actual footage of my father and myself building a marble run at the beach in south of France back in about 2005. A childhood story, a childhood memory, is something we all can relate to, and it's very easy to understand. And the marble run, in fact, is a performance that is so simple. It's just a ball rolling from top to bottom on a set of rails. Childhood memory, simple story. But it is a performance that cannot be fragmented, because if you do so, if you take the rails apart, the ball can't roll anymore, and it wouldn't work anymore, as multiple tests have shown. If it's not done properly, it just won't work. The marble maze was then the final experiment based on the marble run, uh, and it's a short film about three little kids, which represent, in this case, not just the childhood memory, but also the, um, the audience. They are on an adventure, once, for once not in front of their computer, but they go out on an adventure to explore this old factory, which in this case will be the performance venue. It's a multi-story venue, so that means each floor is a fragment of the stage. And inside that venue, they, explore, they um, see this big machinery, and of course, they just, being kids, they can't resist pressing that red button. By doing so, they start the performance. The whole environment becomes suddenly immersive, and the performance is about to start. The ball starts rolling, and so far, the performance is still a very classic audience performance relationship, because it's still a real marble rolling down there. And it took me actually quite a while to build that and make it work. But the audience and the, or the kids, they can directly relate to the performance. They can follow it because the marble has to take the same path as the kids. But when we start to turn it from analog to digital, the marble can suddenly start to take different parts. It can start to jump through walls and ceilings and appear and disappear in different places. Whereas the kids still have to run downstairs to try and follow it. And they might not always experience it in the same way each time they watch the performance, because at some point it might just appear here when they're in the right spot. But in other moments, another part of the audience might see it somewhere else. So you have a unique experience each time. And of course, I tried to make use of it as many different stage te uh, technologies as possible, from lighting to video and even pixel mapping. But then it's very important to turn the marble from, an from, from digital back to analog so that the audience can pick up the marble and basically interact with the performance and then re-trigger and start the performance again. Hey, Mike, catch this. Oh, thank you very much. That's the actual marble from the marble maze, isn't it? Thanks. And uh, thank you very much to you, everyone, for paying even more than just eight seconds of attention to my presentation. It's been a pleasure, and have a very nice day, everyone. Thank you.